Kartik Shankar Nayanan, a research scientist, IBM. Arijit Biswas, research scientist, Amazon India. Pradeep Shanoi, ML scientist, uh, uh, Bing sponsored search, Microsoft India. And chairing the session will be Nilesh Tucker, partner and US practice head, Zinar. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of sessions on AI and machine learning. Um, and uh, so we wanted to have a session where there is actual applications. We have three PhDs here, so there's a high-powered panel. Uh, so I'm going to let, uh, and then Sam and I are from IIT, so it's a, you know, we can kind of balance it out a little bit, Sam. So, so I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves, and then we'll go get into the meat of it. So Sam, go for it. Yeah, and then talk about what projects you're working on and uh, on machine learning. Okay, uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, uh, so I'm Sam Gilway. I'm 30 years in the technology industry across uh, both US uh, as well as in India, last 10 years. I've headed, uh, I'm currently heading EFI. I've headed Avaya, Spice, uh, Telecom, and uh, Amdocs in India. And before that, a handful of startups in the Silicon Valley and some large companies. Um, you know, as, as uh, this discussion unfolds, you, you will, many of you may already be familiar, but you know, you know, there's a big disruption coming, and that disruption is across the board. You know, any company, it's not just machine learning and stuff, it's not just for the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, etc. You know, even industrial companies, banking, all kinds of industries are going to get disrupted. So we are really looking at several very, very interesting you know, uh, applications of machine learning and big data, IoT, uh, stream computing together uh, in our domain, which is a printing and packaging domain. And uh, th these applications promise to be really game changing from both benefits to the customer point of view as well as creating a lot of value. Hi, uh, I'm Pradeep Shinoy. I'm from Microsoft Mike. So Pradeep is actually, if you saw the slide, uh, it says Vishwa. Uh, Pradeep is also from Microsoft Search. So. Uh, how about now? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Pradeep Shinoy. I'm from uh, Microsoft India. I work on the Bing uh, search engine for Microsoft on the monetization uh, aspects of Bing search. So uh, everything having to do with those ads that you see uh, when you search for something. Um, I have a PhD and some postdoctoral research experience from the University of Washington in Seattle and also from uh, UC San Diego where I did uh, number of uh, you know projects in applied machine learning to a variety of areas uh, including uh, uh, neuroengineering uh, neuroscience uh, cognitive psychology and so on and uh, you know now i match ads to your searches so i'm looking forward to a very lively conversation so uh, thank you hi everyone uh, i am arijit uh, i am a machine learning scientist uh, at amazon india uh, until last week i was a research scientist at xerox research india i joined amazon just this week uh, at uh, at Xerox, uh, I was working on uh, machine learning application and deep learning application for uh, problems like education and healthcare. Before that, uh, I did my PhD from uh, University of Maryland College Park, uh, where I was working on uh, machine learning applications for computer vision, mm -hmm. uh, active learning, and semi-supervised learning. And uh, in Amazon, I am uh, working on uh, developing machine learning tools and algorithms uh, for e-commerce and other Amazon business problems. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Karthik Shankar Narayanan. I work, I'm a research scientist with IBM Research. Uh, we're part of a network of uh, globally eight to 10 research labs everywhere from New York to Tokyo to Shanghai to Bangalore. And uh, our group primarily works on applied machine learning for disrupting industries like finance and healthcare and education. 
Uh, before IBM, I finished my PhD from Ohio State University about five years back, uh, working in computer vision and machine learning. So I'm looking forward to a very interesting conversation today. So uh, we're going to make this interactive, so I'll come back to the audience when if you have any questions. So I want to start with Karthik. Uh, so, you know, we've been doing optimizations and machine learning is a kind of optimization for, you know, forever, right? Uh, since we have been, I've been coding and so what is different now? Why machine learning is actually impactful or why can you make it real in real life or usage? So that's an excellent question. In fact, uh, I, it's, it's actually been a confluence of quite a few things that have happened independently. Um, so let's just take uh, one example, right? Like deep neural networks, which have been, uh, which have provided breakthroughs in all the standard AI tasks like speech recognition, natural language processing, uh, image understanding, and all of that, right? Uh, they've been around for decades now, neural networks, right? Right from the 80s. Uh, but what's happened is um, there's been um, a continuous reduction in cost of hardware consistently. So the scales at which we're able to do now and the cheap cost at which we're able to do computation has enabled us to build neural networks at such a large scale, which wasn't quite possible before. And the power of neural networks is their expressivity, right? They're able to learn really complex models. Uh, but to be able to actually learn these complex models, you need an equivalent amount of ton of data. And that has also happened in parallel in the recent past. So being able to learn these extremely complex models which sort of mimic the human computation, uh, and I say this very uh, in a hand wavy manner because we really don't know how human brains work, uh, but which sort of uh, do uh, achieve uh, performance levels on certain pieces of tasks which match up to human levels, right? Um, and this has been possible because we're able to, com the computers are cheaper, faster, at a scale at which you can now learn very complex models with uh, the amount of data, right? And that's sort of been motivating a lot of these industrial applications that we're going towards um, in different domains. So that's actually one of the key factors, yeah. yeah perfect. Arjit, uh, what are the challenges of using machine learning? Are there any drawbacks? Or what should people look out for when? <clears throat> yeah, this is also a very good point. So uh, as Kar Karthik mentioned, so what has changed uh, over the last couple of decades? One is data and another is compute. But the question is, are they enough? I mean, are we hitting the 100% for all the problems and all the domains? Uh, still not. So I still think these are the couple of challenges we need to handle. Like we still need more data uh, for training our deep neural network algorithms. I mean, some of uh, you might know that for training any deep neural network, you need tons of data. And recently, some of the competitions, I think Microsoft owned in ImageNet, they had like 152 layers of deep layers in the deep neural network. So the amount of data that you will need to successfully train even deeper networks uh, is, is one important factor, and we have to keep that in mind. Uh, there are some other challenges. For example, uh, the machine learning approaches which we have, they are still not very generalizable. For example, whatever data you throw to an al algorithm or approach, they only learn those. Okay. If new situations or new kinds of data points arrive, they still struggle. So, uh, so what I mean is our algorithms are still not uh, as intelligent as humans. Okay. So that's that. There we have a long way to go. And another practical problem we have for uh, data scientists or machine learning machine learning scientists is that there are many options to choose from. So. When you are beginning a new problem to look at, I mean, what, what approach or what method do you look at? I mean, probably now you, are, you will be looking at deep neural network. But within deep neural network also, there are many kinds of architectures and then there are many parameters. And how do you choose those parameters to get the successful result? Okay. So that's, I think, one challenge which I have and I think a lot of uh, machine learning uh, people have faced. And uh, that is, uh, if, if we have some uh, ideal way to choose these parameters or this, uh, this architectures that will be good for machine learning in general. So, uh, Pradeep, you want to add something to that? Yes, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, taking a slightly different spin on it, where can machine learning go wrong? Um, the, you know, there's this old phrase from uh, the early days of programming, garbage in, garbage out. So, it's very easy to screw up if you 
learn the wrong thing, if you uh, feed the wrong data in. So we know how badly the models for financial prediction did in 2008 in the uh, world uh, financial markets and how much we had to clean up after that. But there's also interesting interactions that happen at the intersection between machine learning and society. So here's one example. The Tesla driver, uh, you know, the Tesla car that crashed recently and uh, the driver was killed. Uh, automated driving, right? It does really well, but not quite there. It's well enough for you to relax and say, I don't have to pay attention, uh, but not good enough to take care of an extraordinary situation. And suppose an extraordinary situation happens, you don't have enough time to put everything, the context back into your head and say, oh, what do I do now? Uh, again, with driverless cars, you have uh, uh, this sort of uh, optimization problem, right? If you have to crash, who do you kill? Right, and uh, if you go for the, uh, you know, the safer SUV, you know, you can go hit the SUV because the biker is going to die. Then that's sort of incentivizing people to be as unsafe as possible, so that automated cars don't hit them. Uh, so, so there's a lot of interesting uh, places where machine learning interacts with society in unpredictable ways, and that's something we are only going to learn as we go along. Um, Another example is if you learn your models on, you know, pure uh, biased data in some way, let's say uh, racially biased, right? You learn patterns that apply to your, uh, you know, predominant race, uh, higher economic classes, and so on, which may systematically bias uh, the algorithms or the systems against the underprivileged. So those are some examples of how machine learning can go crazy. So, uh, you have anything to add? To yeah, you know, I think it's a too juicy a topic not to <laughs> jump in uh, in that. And you know, I'm, there are a couple of places I may disagree with some of my esteemed colleagues, um, different point of view. You know, one of the challenges that I see clearly is over expectations. What I mean by that, very simply, that uh, Tesla car crash happened after 1.7 million miles of driving. 1.7 million miles of driving. In 1.7 million miles of driving, how many human drivers would have caused an accident that would have been fatal? So let's be realistic. You know, technology is never going to be 100% perfect. But the objective is to do human as good as human or better than human. I mean, even look at ERP systems or other computing systems that are not as mysterious because they are, rule, they are basically rule-based, you know, that we can understand how they arrive at their answers, etc. They are not perfect either. The idea is they do it faster than human. They do it more accurately than human. They don't make as much mistake. That's what it is. So, you know, and if they're, that's acceptable, we are not asking for perfection, then why are we asking for perfection here? The, the only reason I think there's a lot of debate and all this kind of thing, because now it started encroaching on the, what used to be the human realm of decision making. You know, up till now, it was, if it was, uh, you know, automating some task or menial stuff, et cetera, we were more than happy, you know, to do that. But now it started kind of encroaching on our domain. And secondly, these are not rule-based systems. You know, so we don't really understand how they work. We only know they work, and what you know is what you know. What you don't know is what you don't know. So if, you know, it's, it's great till it's proven otherwise. And so whatever we don't understand, we are usually afraid of. That's, that's a human nature. Um, as far as uh, challenges, uh, practical challenges of implementing or using machine learning, you know, most companies are not Googles or Microsofts or Amazons or IBMs, et cetera. So when they have to use machine learning, one of the biggest challenges that they're going to find in their domain is the lack of data. And the, the kind of data that you need to train your algorithms you know, is labeled data. So who's going to label it? It's humans who are going to label it. So it's going to be a human intensive problem to feed copious amount of data. You know, he's talking about 100 layer deep neural network. I mean, how much labeled data that's going to need? And so who, where are you going to provide that? So those are more practical challenges. So there are newer techniques that must emerge, which will reduce the barrier on the amount of labor that is required to prepare the data that's going to eventually train the algorithms. Yeah. Good. Uh, so one other thing is, 
with machine learning obviously you can optimize for the consumer you can optimize for the for the companies which are implementing it and sometimes it could be both but usually you have to make a choice whether i want to make more money or i want to give a better user experience to the user and particularly for arijit and pradeep who are here one is trying to sell ads or have people click on ads that those i'm assuming is trying to get sell more products to them how do you decide what optimizations to make it's a great question um uh, i think the short answer is that uh, there are long term impacts of whatever decision you make so if you're in it for the long haul you do have to worry about uh if you keep pestering your um you know users with irrelevant ads are they just going to get annoyed and stop using your search engine uh so th th there is a trade off and many companies handle uh, it in different ways both at a business level you know you can figure out where you want to put that uh, you know slider between uh company monetization and user happiness uh but also at an algorithmic level uh, sort of an experimentational level uh we most companies like us are building more sophisticated uh platforms for experimentation that allow you to figure out the long term impacts of whatever decisions or changes you might do to your system in fact if you look at the published literature you'll see that more and more this is a trend that's coming up where the companies that experiment on you know their platforms are trying to see if any changes they make result in changes in user behavior or advertiser behavior down the line maybe a month later maybe a few months later so the capacity to model and measure and experiment with the long term ramifications of your uh, uh, choices is one key aspect of dealing with this trade off or is there anything to add to that uh, i completely agree with pradeep i mean uh, that's what i wanted to tell that uh, there are this long term impacts which we need to take into consideration if we just think about one moment uh, and think that we would like to maximize our profit and then the customer will be unhappy they will not purchase again from amazon or not click an ad from microsoft then they will not come back in the future and then we will lose our revenue in the long run so we'll have to make the customers happy and as as far as uh, amazon is concerned uh, what you know that they are very customer centric company so every each and every purchase our sole goal is to keep the customer happy such that they come back and keep on buying stuff at amazon so uh, uh, coming back to kartik how do you measure these long term impacts uh, with the short term optimizations like what are the techniques you've been using to figure that out So actually, that is one of the key challenges, and um, one of the main um, underlying problems that you need to worry about is what is the machine learning algorithm or the system that I'm using as a black box? What is it actually doing? Okay, you need to start to question those things. So, for example, Sam just pointed out like machine learning algorithms are actually starting to help with complex human decision making. Right? They're not just automating some operational tasks, but uh harder tasks like lawyers making decisions about what they going to argue about or uh, oncologist deciding what is the kind of treatment that uh, my patient needs to go through uh the machine learning algorithm cannot just come up and say hey take this uh, this is the treatment that you should recommend right the oncologist with his expertise is going to want to know why did you give this particular treatment the model the machine learning algorithm has to be able to explain what are the trade offs what if you do this in the short term what are the long term benefits are you going to get and some of the approaches we've been taking towards models particularly deep learning and all uh there is very little interpretability of what the model is actually doing right and a lot of the academic academic literature is going towards that direction of trying to understand what insights can i gain from what the algorithm is doing but there's very little work that's been happening and this is one of the key challenges uh can the model machine explain to me what it is doing and with that i can rationalize what are the trade offs and making and how can i tune the knobs towards uh making better decisions can anybody talk about how are you measuring the impact of machine learning is having like what are the KPIs which you guys are using for that you know uh we are looking at you know we are starting to apply uh, machine learning techniques uh where a software sells itself so for example uh you know you bought <coughs> ERP system but you haven't bought certain specialized packages you know 
uh, add-on packages. So the system can actually, uh, as it gathers data, can actually simulate or act actually play out like, you know, let's say it's a shipping package and uh, you, didn't use, you didn't buy the shipping package. So it's going to actually uh, look at every time you enter some shipping related data into your system, into your ERP system, it's going to compare what would the equivalent cost be and the benefits be for, you know, if, if, if it was using the package. And then when that data is statistically significant to make the inference, and the savings are substantial, it will automatically connect the customer and give them the opportunity, give them the ROI, and give them the opportunity to sell itself without human intervention anywhere at all. Uh, that's a clear benefit. I mean, if you look at selling software is a costly endeavor, right? You need inside salespeople, if you're direct selling or whatever, so you are cutting down those expenses and increasing relevance because when we are trying to sell something to somebody at the wrong time, it's spam. You know, at the right time, in the right relevance, the probability, of the, you know, the customer is happy, you are happy. That's a very tangible, calculatable benefit. Same thing with predictive maintenance, for example. You know, every time a $2 million big printing press that we sell, you know, maybe for fabrics or textiles or whatever, breaks down, we got to send somebody to, to the customer side. They got to do diagnostics, figure out what's wrong then figure out what parts they would, they would need, come back again, very expensive. We have to do it, warranty services, et cetera. Using remote diagnostics and predictive maintenance, we are able to do uh, quite a bit of that remotely without sending somebody on site. And in fact, in many cases, even avoiding the failure in the first place. So that has tremendous tangible calculable benefits in terms of cost for doing support and services, mm -hmm. as well as uptime for the customer. And these are just a couple of examples. There are many, many such examples. So one, the coming back to the, some of the downsides which I'm aware of, or, for, or people may be aware of, is uh, privacy concerns. For example, I was listening to an interview from a, a data scientist at, my, at Facebook, and they said we are so good right now that we can actually predict what you're going to do next. Uh, we can actually tell you, and he said we don't announce, we don't talk about this because it scares people. Uh, in fact, the, one of the examples they gave is that we can predict when two people are going to have an affair based on the post they put place, or we can predict that these two people are going to get engaged and then when they're going to get married based on the, 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 the quantity and the quality of the post changes as, the, as their relationship is advancing. And based on that, they can say, okay, these people, and they said we have actually done this analysis and within a week, we have been able to say these people are getting engaged. So, so what do you, that's a pretty scary concept. Uh, what do you guys think about how do you balance that compared to the benefits? I would ask to touch this question. <laughs> <laughs> no, privacy is always a complex question, right? The more you know about someone, the better services you can give them, but the more they're creeped out by it. <laughs> uh, I think it's something we are still figuring out. Uh, all companies are just still figuring out. Google Now is another example. It's a great service when you think about it, but it's rummaging through your email and knowing that you're going to Australia and suggesting, you know, telling you about the weather there. Uh, that's <laughs> weird, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, more and more companies are having to explicitly specify what data they have access to, uh, explicitly uh, allow for opt-ins and opt-outs in a lot of this, um, you know, and um, I think it's still something that we're just figuring out. The more the customers are uh, unhappy with things, the more these things will start rolling back. But the real uh, likelihood is that companies like Facebook are going to just collect more and more and more and more data, and we'll just get used to it. Right. We'll say, yeah, that's the new norm. You know, I, <laughs> I don't know of a time in my life when things were private. So uh, that's another possibility. Anything else? You know, um, we, we actually had a s conversation on this at the lunch table earlier. And uh, you know, I have a slightly different take on it. And that is, you know, of course, it has to be done with permission. The individual users should give permission or not give permission or selectively give permission, et cetera, et cetera. But having said that, you know, there are fascinating benefits that individuals and companies, et cetera, are going to drive from this. And 
to get those benefits, of course, the system needs to understand the data. I compare this with your doctor, for example. So you, you, you know, you're ill. You're going to have to tell the doctor in detail, you know, what are your habits, what do you do, what do you don't do, what are you eating, how long this is, what's your medical history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously, it's personal data. Why are you telling the doctor all this? Why? Because you want to be cured, right? As simple as that. And the doctor is not going to be able to cure you by just looking at your face. You know, he's going to need to know this information. Same thing with your lawyer. Same thing with your financial advisor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today, you know, that role is increasingly going to be taken over by algorithms in step by step by step manner. So why would that part be any different? And if you don't want to, you know, then you don't have to. But those who want those benefits will have to give in the interest of getting a better outcomes and better decisions out of that that they can benefit from. I think that's probably the issue is that today the customer doesn't seem that is like it's not a question of whether I want to, I, I just get it because I'm using a particular system. So anything to add? So just to add to what uh, Sam was saying, right? Uh, uh, there is, just like you talk to your financial advisor and you tell him everything about your family and your likes and dislikes and plans and things like that, uh, there is opportunity for business model innovation, right, around the whole entire data economy, right? What should I share and what do I get back in return? If I tell my financial advisor this, I'm likely to get some better returns in the, so that sort of platform around how do I share data and what do I get back in return? How do I incrementally reveal this information? What do I get back in return? Um, in the consumer space, this is all completely open area, not, not many answers are there. But in the enterprise space, at least, where uh, the same analogy applies, like uh, if a bank shares something about uh, what its transactions and all of that are, right? And it can get to understand information about its competitors, right? By looking at aggregate industry information. Uh, how much of its own information does it share so that it can get aggregate information and get some models and predictions out of there? That same uh, data economy is sort of already ahead of the curve a bit in the enterprise space. Uh, but in the consumer space, it's, it's really completely wild. Any questions from the, can you get a mic? current topic that lastly discussed uh, I mean we can give selective permissions but is it possible you know in some way to withdraw selectively because every agreement has to have a termination clause so is there a way of you know our thought process that is going on in the algor machine algorithm industry that you know I mean I might have given the data yeah, unknowingly also yeah I might have given the data unknowingly also but now I want to withdraw the permission of that data or you know this so how can I do that because you know once given is not forever given, right? That permission. So companies do have forget me uh, buttons on their uh, pages right now. So you can go and erase all the history they have of you in the past. Uh, the, the bigger problem is not, I mean, yes, there's a lot of innovation that has to happen in the uh, data economy and the permission giving, taking space. But the bigger problem is you can make inferences about people that no one could have dreamed about, right? So <laughs> uh, I think it was AOL which handed out a ton of search queries and results data to the public saying, hey, you know, build better algorithms. What they didn't know was that just looking at the search queries, you could figure out who gave those queries, what their social security numbers are, uh, you know, uh, they're trying to kill their wife, <laughs> right? All these kinds of things just come out of that data that in, a ways, in ways that you couldn't have predicted. So that's, I think, going to be harder to manage. Hello. Okay, on the Tesla example you mentioned uh, with the failure rate, so the question is, how do you know the machine has learned enough? How do you verify that, okay, I wanted the machine to learn this and it has learned enough? You can have standards and uh, levels of performance. The tricky part is, uh, as Sam is perfectly right in saying that, you know, they're doing already way better than humans on average. The tricky part is uh, if I kill myself, that's okay. But if a machine kills me, that company is responsible, right? So there's a dichotomy there. I don't think you can ever get to perfect. You, you, no, but my question is more about yeah. how do you define what is yeah, the yeah. process of learning and when so, it has stopped for you? So, you know, um, how do you know as a human that you have learned something? 
I passed the test. Get you the passed the test. Yeah. So there is a surrogate, you know, which somehow scores uh, what your level of learning is. Similarly, the algorithms, uh, depending upon what task that they are trying to do, have levels that are given. So for example, uh, for driverless cars, there are algorithms such as putting them through certain situations, rain, snow, sleet, slippery roads, this, that, other, certain amount of miles. Like, like for example, in the airline industry, to qualify to fly a commercial flight, you have to have certain air miles under your belt. The same thing, you know. Whether that is enough or not enough, that's for somebody else to decide. Just like whether a test is a enough uh, correlation to real knowledge that you're gathered or not. Thank you. Anything else to add? Hello. No. Yeah. So I have a There's one in the back. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So you all spoke about different areas where uh, these algorithms are used to learn and uh, take decisions, like uh, lawyer, oncologist, and then. Can you hold the mic closer? Yeah, yeah. Atom Well. Um, so I'm just wondering if there are any standards evolving around these algorithms, or is there any body working around, working on different domains to evolve around any standards on this, or? Uh, all of these stay proprietary as of today. So you mean standards for acceptance test, test testing, depending upon the domain, or your standards of uh, something else? Like how the, how the algorithm um, learns. Basically, the standards an algorithm has to comply to uh, for learning things. Like, you know, um, you talked about uh, a road accident. And um, uh, what does it capture? Uh, in that case, ah. uh, to to learn. So these kind of uh, these are all domain specific. But again, I'm just wondering if there is anybody working around different domains uh, for standardizing things uh, in 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 algorithms. So you know uh, that's a very very good question. <laughs> in fact, all the PhD scientists over here sitting here will tell you a lot of it is still kind of black magic, black art keeps uh, data scientists' uh, job security uh, secure. Uh, <laughs> but really, you know, feature selection is the one of the toughest problems. You know, which data to gather to solve which particular problem, and what data is going to be highly relevant versus barely relevant versus not relevant, et cetera. So they can answer this better. But Or maybe your uh, question was uh, on what a level of performance should we expect uh, uh, guaranteed no, my, my from? My question was not around the, the um, testing and acceptance of an algorithm. My question was around different domains having different requirements of learning. Like, you know, I see at some things mm. and perceive some things and learn myself. Similarly, algorithms do. So uh, in different domains, um, uh, you know, are there any standards or anybody working around standardizing uh, the aspects that have that, that 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 the algorithms have to comply to? I think it's a case by case basis mm. as far as I know. Yeah, maybe I'm asking. Yeah, um, I'll just give you one data point. Uh, so, even okay. so uh, yeah, I mean it varies uh, significantly from case to case. Uh, but for each domain, for example, if you work with text. There is probably bag of words. Or if you want with images, there is probably shift features or some deep neural network features. So these kinds of standardization uh, people have figured out, and they begin with that. But based on your particular situation or particular problem, you will have to modify on that and Im improve your approach or feature extraction algorithm. So the academic community has well understood benchmarks, uh, like you mentioned, right? At which. Uh, you measure performance for newer algorithms and all. Also in the industry side, right, like use case by use case basis, or domain by domain, you will have certain benchmarks. So, in the, so let's say, for example, uh, a machine has to predict, given a radiology image, whether there's a tumor in it or not, right? So there are well understood benchmarks for how well uh, a machine has to perform and whether it passes that test or not, right? So there are... Uh, Example, uh, IBM itself is having a computer pass the medical test to be certified as a doctor itself. So there are well understood human benchmarks and you have computers trying to beat that and uh, sort of for acceptance. So uh, again, I'm sorry yeah. to elaborate it again. Um, uh, basically I was wondering, um, uh, does it, um, is it 
you know uh, specific to domain wise or um, is the algorithm generic enough to know what it is and then learn uh, even even though the domain is um, not known to the algorithm um, uh, taking the algorithm at a higher level uh, learning about it and then taking a decision on it it's a holy grail we are nowhere near there everything is custom uh, there's a lot of domain expertise you have to come there's a toolbox you have but a lot of domain expertise that is needed uh, no general solution yet, no standard approaches for a new area that we can prescribe just out of the box. So, just, uh, you know, the algorithm per se, so if you say what's a deep learning neural network, you know, and what algorithm does it follow, that's pretty much the same. What is different is, okay, so how many layers do you need to solve a particular problem? How many neurons should be in that layer? What should be the learning rate? What should be the activation function? There are a lot of these things. There are no real standards yet. Or even what data you should model to get the answer that you're looking for. Which part, which data is going to be relevant and highly relevant to solve that problem? So there is no standards for that yet. So we I have a question, time, uh, slight extension to this question. Uh, can we take that on later? We are running out of time, sorry. so. <laughs> Um, so I just want to leave you on a, a, a thank you all for the panel, a really awesome panel. Let's give them a hand. Um.